With God, there is always more. More love, more life, more freedom. Welcome to Zoe's Exploring More with Michael Thompson. C.S. Lewis once wrote, Our Heavenly Father has provided many delightful ends for us along our journey, but He takes great care to see that we do not mistake any of them for home. Join me and the team as we explore the kingdom together, discovering the deep truths and offering encouragement for the journey. There is always more. Welcome, friends and allies, to the Exploring More podcast with Michael Thompson. I'm Michael Thompson. I'm with my friends, SJ, Tom, and Scott, and it's great to be at this table. For our listeners, we just talked about it. We got a new table. We got new seats, and the microphones are now closer to our chins rather than up by our eyebrows, which is, yeah. just <laughs> listeners wouldn't know that, but might... I thought that's pretty funny. This yeah. is the new and improved Exploring More podcast from a physical realm perspective. There so. might be a little less of the Darth Vader yeah. breathing, if you've noticed that before. We though. had these really hard bench, hard seats, and now we have what I call contoured. Yeah, saddles. Saddles. Really is what they are. Nice yeah, but leather. That, that's for you big guys that sit up. I'm old and hunched over, so <laughs> you can only see yeah. my eyebrows when I'm talking. That's yeah, right. that's right. You just like to look over the top of your glasses. Yeah, everybody's yeah, got that. their specs on and... Uh, <laughs> Well, wisdom flows. So right. uh, yeah, exploring more podcast. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to explore more in a series. It's a five-part series that starts today with the ingredients of love. This was something, SJ, you've brought to the table and said, I, I want us to talk about this. Because we do talk about this at conferences. It's part of the map, the Two Realms, Two Kingdoms map. But explain yourself, man. <laughs> <laughs> what's, uh, what's the deal? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's funny. Many have heard my stories. You know, I've told it here on the podcast before. I didn't grow up in the church hearing about how God is love and this and that. And the other thing about him, I had a radical intersection with him about midlife, 35, 36 years old, maybe a little before midlife, however you want to slice that up. And I understood, okay, God is love. Jesus loves me. What does that really mean? And then I came in contact with Zoe and this message of the heart and her that love is validation, acceptance, worth, belonging, and significance. And I thought, wow, that's a whole nother level of explanation of love. I mean, you know, everybody has a favorite dish maybe that their mom made or their grandmother or whatever. You never really knew quite what was in there, mm -hmm. but you knew you liked it. You yeah. enjoyed it when yeah. you had it. So that was kind of true of my experience of God's love for me. I really loved it. I enjoyed it, but I didn't know what was in it, really. So I kind of reached a point in my journey where I wanted to know, what is love made of? How does God see us? So I figured I'm not the only one, maybe, yeah. you know, that wanted to know those things. And I want to explore these terms more deeply anyway. So yeah, that's why it came up. Well said. We live in a time, right? men where ingredients, I think, matter more than they ever have. Oh, yeah, with gluten. I mean, you look at the boxes stuff. now. My mm -hmm. wife and daughters, they are all about what's in it. We found out a long time ago, you know, our girls had a couple allergies to, right. to certain foods. And you know how you find that out? Yeah, they have <laughs> the, a, the hard attack. way, right? Yeah. And so we are, we're very, very committed now to ingredients. And we've told this story before you know, you flip something over and you look at the ingredients. I think if love had a box, that's what you're saying, SJ, if love had a box, what are the ingredients in this? And love's a pretty worn word. It's used in many, many, many contexts in many, many ways. I love oh, yeah. pizza. I love this movie. I love you. There's a lot of ways that it gets thrown around. So for the ingredients on this box, if you flipped it over and you said validation, acceptance, worth, belonging, high fructose syrup, you know, <laughs> so those ingredients yeah. were, nugget. that's, that's what we're, and nougat, that's right, nougat. Yeah. Nougat. <laughs> nougat Snickers bar. So that's what we're trying to talk about from our experiences yeah. in walking with God, exploring the kingdom. And this is a huge subject in the scriptures, mm -hmm. and it ought to be a huge subject in our experience mm -hmm. with the one who made us. And we're going to talk some more about that. You had thoughts, Scott? Yeah, love is a hijack word. You know, a single word used for dozens of variations of emotion and feelings and responsibilities. It's sort of like Christianity. I mean, you throw that word up there, but you have no idea what it means to... Lots of different flavors out there. 
the mm-hmm. person saying it. And mm-hmm. we should be careful through our podcast and our exchange and our sharing to focus on the ingredients, not the cake that it bakes, right? We taste the cake. This is good. Love is good. Love feels good. I like the taste of love. But what I think we're trying to do, men, is, okay, how do we get that cake? What went in to that cake? And it's easy to bump back and forth because it's all love, but let's try to be surgical. This is molecular. That's what the beauty of the ingredients are is separately, they kind of create something else. But when you put them all together, something larger, something more is made. And so there's variations of this. Let's look at this from some different angles and from our life experiences. What does it mean? But I would want to make sure that we recognize that there's the noun, there's the verb, there's the fact, there's the experience, you know, and that's what we want to explore a lot of that. Do you have some, Tom? We just have one word in our language, which is love, but in the Greek, there's what, five different words right. to express five different types Kinds. of love. Mm-hmm. And we'll probably explore some, some of, of that, that too. Some of that through the podcast, sure. But I think we need all the versions that are available to us and part of forming us and making us whole, giving us a whole heart, which, you know, if there's a piece missing, that's the one that God's most likely going to bring, you know? Yeah, especially if you're meant for that and it's missing, Yeah, you may long for that. You know, you talk about deficiencies, vitamin D, vitamin E, you need more this in your diet. There's something that's B12 lacking, or right? Whatever, yeah. So this is really a big conversation. And there's a reason why we get to have five podcasts yeah. about it, because it's going to take a while to explore it. And I want to start as a transition from the introduction to... We believe that love is what you're made for. And that's why it's another important exploration. When you find out what something's made for, it gives that something purpose and meaning. It's more than usefulness. A hammer is the best thing to hammer with. It's mm-hmm. made to hammer. Right. Right. A plate holds food. Forks are for one thing, spoons are for another. And if you're fortunate and you have a spork, you know, you can, you can get a lot of miles out of that. But you know what I'm saying, Tom, what yeah. something's made for. So what were we made for? When the Trinity had the brilliant idea of creating image bearers, Adam and Eve, what were we made for? And I think if we can nail that down, I think it can add tremendous substance to why explore love. Joe Ehrman, in the book that was very influential in my life about his coaching, to find it very succinctly, that life's purpose is the capacity to love and the ability to be loved. And those are two very important metrics. Yeah. And when we talk about love, we have to look at the posture that we're speaking from. Are we speaking and describing and sharing as a recipient or alternatively, and equally as important, are we speaking and sharing as the giver of love, the provider of love. Maybe they need to be different words, right? But those are different things. And I think it would behoove us, and I'd encourage us to create clarity between us and for all our listeners to know which lane we're bowling in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, there's yeah. probably 13 bowling lanes out there, and they're right. all named love. Right. But each one is a different lane. It'd be fun to keep the gutters on, just stay in that gutter. If we want to go to another gutter, we can. Yeah, but I find it interesting in that. First of all, well, I have not been behooved in a while. It's been so <laughs> yeah, I, I just, I just, I just heard. I behooved. would behoove you to hold your thought for a second, <laughs> okay. so I could get this out or off. I don't even know what no, that I'm means. Who said that? <laughs> you did. You just did. <laughs> Which Tom? You say that? No. no. Uh, it would behoove us. I don't want to be behooved. Yeah. Go ahead. It sounds bad. Dan Cabbage is a thesaurus, anyways. He is. Yeah. I think it's interesting in that quote that you brought up: the ability to be loved as if there might be something in the way. And I think as we go through this That'll discussion have to and come we talk out. about the ingredients, we've got to talk about why can't we see them, hear them, smell them, taste them, touch them. What's in the way? So yeah. us being able to receive those things. So the ability to be loved or the inability to be loved could be named unlovable. Now let's flip to another lane and say, how do you love and can you love the unlovable? And for how long? Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're kind of getting into future uh, yeah, discussions, sure, sure. but yeah. I'm telling you, this has got a lot of philosophical, theological stuff to it. So put it, buckle so, up. Yeah, let me, let me put, <laughs> so let me put this target out there in the sense that if we were created for love, 
by love. The Trinity is in love. It's in a fellowship, Father, Son, and Spirit, and they love one another. And so the opportunity to just get that one thing, if we were made for love, then it not only makes sense, I think around the table and maybe the listeners around the world would agree, we long for this. And the point of this bigger conversation is, what is this? that we long for. Let's try to bring some clarity. Right. I think Scott's bringing out critical element of loving and being loved. Which lane are we talking about? We're going to say yes, Mm -hmm. all the above, both and. And when you think about your need, your desire, Tom, to be loved, you're made for love, so you long for that. How has that looked in your life? It's just to put that in context, what I think you're saying, if God is love, and we're made for love. We're made for God. In other words, we're his idea. We're his plan. You know, before the creation even began, we were seen and known by him as to who we would be as sons and daughters, you know, holy and blameless. And so we weren't just a afterthought. It right. came along, you know, at some point along the way. I think God wanted to be known. God created us because we're the only part of creation that can actually know God. And we've got to a place, we've got the capacity to receive that and to know that more than any other creature. So for me, coming out of my story, there wasn't a lot of feeling seen and known as a young boy, just a lot of stuff going on in my family and circumstances. But I remember wanting to matter. I just wanted to be important to someone, you know, and because I didn't have that sense, I was a very precocious kindergartner and seeking attention and yeah, great I would word. do crazy stuff, you yeah. know, to get the teacher's attention, you know. Attention. So love has an element of oh, yeah, that. To be seen. It, we've said this for years and learned it from other friends and allies. The question that it's that a big hearts part of it. Mm-hmm. that hearts move about this planet, and it can be very buried, but the question is still, do you see me? Mm-hmm. And right. do you love what you see? Right. Acceptance. It's a huge idea. And yet it's very hard when you're running on the lack of it. You'll act out. You'll act up. Mm -hmm. Or you will try to prevent for yourself from being hurt or protect yourself and just ascribe to the idea that I'm going to live with less of it. So I'm going to try somehow to want less of it. How's that work? Right. (laughs) Just pretending because you're not getting it, because you're not seen, because you're not receiving that, well, then I don't really need it anyway. I mean, yeah. that's okay. Because I'm a self-reliant guy. I'm the guy that's uh, the class clown. I'm whatever mm-hmm. persona then we adopt at whatever point it happens. You know, you talk about kindergarten. It could be earlier, could be later. But we adopt that persona to try to help ourselves rationalize why we're not receiving the love that our hearts desire. What kind of strategy does a six-year-old really come up with but to act out? And so we want to help all the listeners. If you're going to stick with us for four more sessions, what we're advocating is, like you said, Tom, God is love, and He is the only one who can handle the weightiness and the neediness of that desire in which He put in you for Himself to be loved. So we've got a lot of things to explore and talk yeah. about and a lot of things to understand and to share from some of the misunderstandings I even had about God. I got to share one. I just grew up. It was very clear to me that he's to be feared. And I've shared this in other podcasts, the way he was presented, sometimes the presenter, the preacher, the pulpit, I mean, he was pretty angry. So God must be angry. And it's very, very, very difficult, if not impossible in that lane, Scott, right? To be loved by someone that you don't trust. Right. Or that you're afraid of. And so those are things the enemy has done to hijack this. Did you use the word hijack earlier? Was I, that you? I did. Yeah. yeah. Well, how it's hijacked. Befuddled. Anybody use that before? Befuddled. Befuddled. <laughs> when, you, when you talk about the idea of loving the unlovable, how could there be anything unlovable? Really? We've believed and bought into that idea that we're unlovable or we're unworthy or we don't deserve for God to have his affection toward us continuously and thoughts. I mean, God's attention is on each one of us continually, never off. Sometimes we have these crazy ideas that we can go in hiding for a while, you know, and do what we're going to do and then come back and ask forgiveness, thinking somehow 
you know, God either wasn't paying attention or... Or we checked ourselves into punishment or yeah. isolation mm-hmm. or solitude, solitary confinement, and then we can come out and maybe he won't be so mad. I think a core point we want to make in this series is that we are lovable. We are. We were made... We're made that way. Yes. 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 And Amen. it's not a feat of denial for God to look upon us with love and affection, because what he sees is what he made and what okay. he had in mind. The world has convinced us otherwise, and our experiences would tell us, maybe I'm not that worthy because of what I've done. What we've done doesn't determine our identity. Mm. It doesn't determine who we are. I would say every person has experienced and still is experiencing that sense of being unlovable. Oh, yeah. I think that's part of our journey. I think even if you're aware and oriented to that truth and you've done some work to undo that lie that you're unlovable, I think it's one of those ones that, you know, Satan just is like, okay, well, that's not working right now, but you know what? I'm going to save that one for a more opportune time, and I'm going to bring the high heat, you know, the outside fastball, whatever Mm -hmm. metaphor you want to use. I'm going to bring it back around at some point. And it just comes back up and comes back up. No, you won't get rid of it. You won't won't wash this off. You won't dig this out. I mean, even when you've got it to a point where you've resolved childhood wounds and you've really done the work to unearth those things, he still brings it back around. The enemy, I mean. Yeah. The idea of lovability is connected to behavior. In our culture. In our our culture. And unlovability is connected to behavior. But the first and foremost lovability that we only get to understand, I think, you know, in our later years, and we're trying to educate people earlier, is the idea that lovability comes from God. Lovability comes from the value that you have because God made, made you. you. And your behavior is mostly the slightly irrelevant. Mm-hmm. You have the ability to be loved. I will love you at that level as Christ instructed us, because you're a child of God created in his image. So in light of that, when I go forward in 1980 to an altar to give my life over to Jesus Christ and experience this incredible, deep-felt sense of having been forgiven, that was for me. Because I was carrying the weight of all the sin and all the stuff I had done in my life and all the broken promises and all the failures of character and that kind of thing, which is completely about behavior. And yet, I don't think it changed God. That moment wasn't a transference in God's heart toward me because I asked for it. It was already there, but it was a Bethel moment in my heart where I knew on that Mm -hmm. day, at that moment, the Father and I are good. Mm -hmm. That's gone. I don't need to carry that weight. And I had no idea, honestly, how much guilt and shame I was carrying in my life. It was just this ambient feeling. The refreshment that comes for that for so many people, when they have that moment, it's all good. The slate's clean now. Come walk with me, you know, and it doesn't mean you'll do it perfectly. But that was a huge download of God's love, wiping that clean for me and telling me, I see you. I love you. That's a seminal moment in anyone's life. And it seems to me it slipped into a chronology, and that is this, to experience love creates the ability to love. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? Heck experience yeah. Spot love. on, yeah. If That's you, right. When you experience being loved and beloved like that, then you now have the expanded capacity to love like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the ultimate is to experience that love vertically, from the Father, then we can apply it and share it horizontally. A yep. shorter way to do it is Amen. you experience love horizontally, and then you share your horizontal exchange. Yeah, that's not sustainable. That's up and down. It's emotional. It's good yep. and bad. What'd you do for me lately? But the vertical love is more significant. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So before we break, this idea that you had an encounter, you had an experience mm-hmm. with love, with God. Right. God is love. John says. So what we want to also be advocates for in this whole series is if that was the last time that you've experienced his love, something's not right. And we know friends and allies that it's been a while since they've enjoyed what they were made for. And there's a variety of reasons why, but we want to be champions of this idea that 
that shouldn't be the last time. Your conversion, when you got relief from carrying all that with you, you didn't know how much you were carrying. Mm -hmm. We want to tell some stories when we get back of how God's loving us. Because I just had to put another tank of gas in my truck. You said this earlier, it's the fuel that it runs on. And so with us, C.S. Lewis says that he is the fuel that the human machine runs on. God is love. And so we want to be champions of this can happen, this loving you, it's going on. And he wants to be, you used another word earlier, Tom, affectionate. He's affectionate towards you. Mm -hmm. And we want to talk about that when we come back from the break. This is not a sterile love. This is not a factual love, even though it's a fact. But this is to be experienced and enjoyed at a heart level, at a need level, at a longing level for the very thing you were mm -hmm. created for by the one who loves you. Yeah. And so we'll talk about that in just a minute when we come right back. Hey, Exploring More podcast listeners, this is SJ. Just want to take a second and invite you to one of our upcoming events. The Heart of a Warrior Encounter West is taking place Thursday, September 12th through Sunday, September 15th at Young Life's Trail West Camp in Buena Vista, Colorado. During the weekend, we have three main objectives. We want to help a man get his heart back, teach him how to fight, and show him where the battles are. To see Christ come for a man's heart and what God is up to in validating a man, initiating him, and calling him into the larger story is truly a glorious thing. It's a fierce journey for every man, but one that desperately needs to be taken. I personally have enjoyed more than a dozen of these Heart of a Warrior weekends, and God keeps coming back again and again for my heart and showing me more and more areas that he wants to come into and redeem and restore. Again, it's September 12th through the 15th in Buena Vista, Colorado. Visit zoe.org forward slash events, zoe.org forward slash events for more information. And I hope to see you out there in Colorado. Welcome back to the Exploring More podcast. Yeah, this is grand. This is maybe the biggest thing we can talk about and explore, <laughs> right? Uh, it, it uh, what is, I love about that is that you said that about freedom too. When yeah. we did the freedom season. You know what? And let me tie them together. Let yeah. me tie them together okay. right now. All because right. being loved is free. It sets you free. No does. doubt. And we talked about that. Yep. So if you haven't listened to the Freedom, freedom Podcast, series, the Freedom yeah. Series, you're going to hear some harmony between this conversation and that one. You brought up offline, Matthew 3, and I want to give you the ball for a minute. This idea of one of the ingredients, a critical ingredient to love is validation. Yeah, absolutely. If we look at the scripture, if we look at Matthew 3, 17, which is, you know, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased, right after Jesus gets baptized, the voice from heaven comes down as the voice of God talking about his son, and he receives that validation. So we're talking about Jesus here, right? If Jesus needs this validation and longs for this validation from God and this demonstration of love, to then go into the season of tempting he goes into immediately following this happening, I mean, it must mean we're going to need it too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would think. Oh, yeah. I read that, and I read it now again, over and over again, that passage, and I say, man, I want some of that right there. Yeah. I that, long for it. The longing, the desire. You brought up the word, Scott, offline, belovedness. I mean, <laughs> this happens all the time. We take a time out, catch our breath. And the conversation sometimes goes on. And then you said, SJ, okay, stop talking. Let's, <laughs> yeah. let's get back on the we recording. Get this on so the, why are we here though? On the real, right. real. So belovedness, yeah. but you brought mm -hmm. up that. This is my beloved son mm -hmm. right, in whom I'm well pleased. This I mean, is just the power. idea that God would speak to us, over us. You know, there was another person received validation in that story, which was John. Sure. Because it said, upon him whom you shall see the spirit descend and remain, that one is he who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. So imagine you got that word from God, and then you saw it. And then it happened. Yeah, I mean, that is validating. I yeah. can hear God. I can yeah. hear his voice. John eleven <laughs> four. on the day that I'm diagnosed with this terminal leukemia, it's a pretty hard day. And I opened the Bible. I don't know what I was looking for. I don't know what happened. I'm in John 8, 9, 10 something. I flipped the page on the other side is John 11. I don't even know what John 11 is. I'm going to close the Bible, and I skim the first, second, third, fourth, fifth. 
I go, wait a minute. I shut the Bible. I go, wait a minute. What's John 11, 4? John 11, 4 is where Jesus says, this illness will not end in death, but will be for the glory of the Father. Yeah. I just shut the Bible. I don't think I could talk for a day that no. that was spoken to me wow. in that situation at that That's moment. That's a needful word. And there's no <laughs> doubt in anybody's mind, yours included, everybody tell that story to, that's straight from God. 100%. I see you. I love you. I'm with you through this. That's a great definition for beloved. It's being loved. The one that's being loved is the beloved to the one who's loving them. Right. And I know this is theology that we throw around all the time. He loves the most. He loves first. And that is really the way the cart and horse have to stay. We're invited to love him back. And I think you said earlier in the first half of this session, Scott, that experiencing being loved I want to go on record as there's an emotion to this. There are feelings about this. Yes, it's factual. There's a sterile reality that God is love. But that doesn't move hearts like a passage in John 11 or a moment when you can't describe it, but this thing comes over you and you know that he wants to carry what I've been carrying. He will take this away. Mm -hmm. I mean, you think about the different ways people respond to the gospel and the different gospels that they respond to. Forgiveness is definitely one of them. It's Mm -hmm. a champion. But have you heard the gospel that you'll never have to be alone again? And so people respond to, I can have a friend. He'll be with me. He'll never leave me or forsake me. You know, yes, I've done things. I've regretted things. And you respond to the gospel of, he'll wash it all away. If he'll give you meaning and purpose, aimlessness, purposelessness, people who've lived under that kind of spell from the enemy, they'll move at that gospel. And we need them all. We need all those elements and all those pieces. But this word validation, how does that play into this conversation? Matthew 3, if Jesus needed that or got that, the implication is he needed that, we might need that. Yeah, I think it's absolutely wind in your sails, to use that metaphor. You know, so many of us have the stories of great fathers or great moms or great families or coaches that validated us. And I would say just as many have the same story, but it's the opposite side of the coin where they didn't receive that validation. And that doesn't mean that they're not still hungry for it, right? Just because they haven't experienced it truly. And so part of the journey, again, going back to, you know, you asked me, why do we want to talk about this? When I think about validation... There's validating moments through my life. After coming to know Jesus, though, I'm able to see them more easily, I think. Mm. I think previously I had my own way, my own lenses of, well, if they don't say this, and if they don't do it in front of this number of people or these specific people, I'm not really being validated the way I want to be validated, right? As opposed to God chooses the how, the Mm -hmm. when— the who, mm-hmm. the yeah. where. I mean, he chooses yeah. all of those factors. We're in Ohio a couple of weeks ago, and we're sitting around a table kind of debriefing after an event. We had 700-some guys we went and talked to, and we're just going around the horn talking about how it went, and one of the guys just looks at me and says, man, we need to hear from you more often, because I had shared in a responsive role to Michael's presentation. Mm-hmm. And that was a moment of validation, right. you know, yeah. and I've kind of thought through that a little bit since. Yep. There, there might have been a part of me previously that would say that and apply a little false humility, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, like, oh, no, no, no. You know, yeah, not me. Yeah. It's, 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 it's all God. It's all God, you know, that's great, yeah. you know, but the more and more I've traveled in this message, I can say, yeah, thank, thank you, you for that moment, Jesus. That was great. It's huge. Two things. I'm going to hit one. Tom's got another. Who gave you that? Jesus. Right. To see that is what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. To see a loving compliment or encouragement and recognizing that it's the father giving that man or woman a package to give to you. Yeah. They're the delivery boy. Through through a guy who's a a high powered lawyer. I mean, yeah. Excellent communicator and a pastor. Also an excellent communicator. I think this is great. This is why some people see it, right, Scott, and some people don't. I was just going to say part of validation is. When you discover or you come to believe that what you are hoping for is true or what you want to be true about yourself is true. 
It's you know, seen. It's like, it's, yes. Yes, it's brought to the it surface. Gives, it gives it authority in your life, especially when it's coming from someone who has authority, that like a so father, good. like your dad. Why is that so powerful when a dad sees his son or daughter becoming something wonderful? And it's not just you're wonderful, but when it gets specific because of mm-hmm. the way you handled that little boy who was feeling, you know, left out, or the way you've worked so hard at trying to be better at baseball or at school, or I know this is hard for you and I know you're struggling, but I see what you're doing. That is wonderful. That'll fill a tank. Yeah. You'll walk a little higher. And I like what you said. It does depend on, in some cases, who's delivering it. Yeah. Real quick story. About a year ago, we were together at Tom's place. We got away to Florida and we were there and I was unveiling to you guys this heart that I had. I was moving towards this next book that we're writing called King Me. We're sitting there in that living room and I'm showing you a clip from The Greatest Showman. Yeah, I do remember. And I loved it. It was the trailer and a clip about P.T. Barnum and it's a musical and it's a wonderful story. And you said, why do you love it? You kind of drew me out. I said, I love what he does to people. And he's in his own story, but I love what he does to people. He goes after these hearts, gives them a place in which they can shine. Yeah, the unseen, the unwelcome. In which they can offer. Do you remember Mm -hmm. what you said? Because I remember this too, but go ahead. And it's so funny because I'm not sure if Tom remembers, I didn't cue him up, but we don't often remember some of the things that God puts in our hands to put in somebody else's. Mm -hmm. But you said in the room, Michael, that's what you do. Right. It was so validating. I think that story, the actual Mm -hmm. way that story went was... I think we saw the film, and I said, I know why you like that oh, story. I think you're right. Yeah, you I are. know why you show that. I know why you love this, because this is you. This is what you do. Mm-hmm. It was so obvious. And it's the Bar- heart of it. And, yeah. it's, the, and the story is Barnum's story in becoming a good king. Yeah. And he falls. He falters. Right. And that's the very thing that happens and gets redeemed in a way that he'll never do that again. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's how mm-hmm. God redeems some of our mistakes they're learning. And I think that's part of validation is the training in being entrusted with a compliment, yeah. being entrusted with the life of another. And unfortunately, you've made a mistake or two that you can hopefully learn from. Another piece of that is that it helps us see parts of our glory that we don't see. In other words, it shows us parts of who God made us to be, especially when God is the one delivering that one. Oh, man. You know? Yeah. You, it's you, the... you just... <laughs> yeah. Something that you would not have known or you would not have even suspected. Or was dots part of you your... didn't connect. You know, yeah. had you connected those dots until not, Tom did? No. For you? No. Okay. No. So it reminds me of Band of Brothers and they're in the Battle of Bastogne and they're lacking leadership, leadership at the lieutenant level over the platoons and lost the smaller, a lot lost know, a lot of guys. Yeah, lost right a lot then. of guys, mm-hmm. lost some great lieutenants to wounding and things like that. And here's this guy, he's a sergeant, non-commissioned officer. His name's Carwood Lipton, and he's running around making sure you need some blankets, you need a pair of socks, I'll see what I can do. Man, your boots are all torn up. What size are you? I'll see if I can find them. And after the battle, Captain Spears talks about this guy who took care of the troops. He's talking about Carwood, and Carwood's just standing there, and Spears says, do you know who I'm talking about? And Carwood's like, I don't know who you're talking about. I'm talking about you. (laughs) I'm talking about you. You're the one that kept the unit together in one of the hardest challenges it's ever faced. And he just was flabbergasted, Carwood was. And he got the battlefield commission. And the the scene ends like at your house for me, that scene ends with a grin. Lipton is going, huh, with a smile. That is true. When you say, I see you, I know why you love that. And you call that out and up like you did in Dayton just last month. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. That's a gift. And you receive it. It's one of the greatest things you can do for the giver. And at the same time, who are you really saying thank you to? Yeah. If you know that those good gifts, right? Matthew 12, Mm -hmm. our father in heaven knows how to give good gifts. Do you see them? And some of those gifts are going to be in this package, this wrapping called validation. Right. So some of your listeners, you may not know this, but Scott Snake Cabbage, who's with us again today, he would say he had a cup of coffee in the NFL. He, it's cream and sugar. <laughs> with a little bit of cream and sugar. But, you know, UNC starting quarterback for all four years or? Was uh, two. It two? Okay. So you lived in a system, Scott, of earning your own validation for a long time. So give us. And losing it. And a losing times it a couple and times. Earning it back. It was hard fought. I'll say yeah, one so, thing before he does yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Scott, in my world, 
is one of the most powerful validators of other men I've ever met. He has something about him that God is using it in a very, very powerful way. And I want to validate that, that yeah. because it's, it's true. Yeah. We've seen it. You know, I tell a story throughout my college and pro career, which is a yeah, good day, I'm a good quarterback, bad day. Am I a bad quarterback? I mean, which one am I? Am I a good quarterback having a bad day or just a bad quarterback every once in a while has a good day? You can't live like that. You can't live up and down on some element of performance. And so my own personal value, I actually overcompensated by telling myself how good I was. And that came into arrogance and, you know, that wielded a big sharp sword that caused a lot of scars, but Used nobody to. was validating me. You know, mm -hmm. and, and the coaches aren't validating you. They're they're evaluating you. Yeah, you know, yeah, they're they're not validating. They're mm -hmm. evaluating, and you know, I was a free agent and coming up from. So the whole bias is set against you. So if you don't affirm yourself, then you don't have a chance. Is the first thing. But learning to wield the authority of validation is a very, very powerful, powerful tool, and when it's done well the right time, the right way, the right words, the right person. It could be a seminal moment in a man's mm -hmm. life or a boy's life. Right. When it's not done well, it can be equally as destructive. And the root of the whole thing of validation, this may or may not be true, but validation is based on value. Based something on that's valid. Something mm -hmm. that is valid and mm -hmm. valuable. I recognize and I affirm your value to the team, to your family, your value to me. I recognize your value. And we all have inside us an That's aspirational good. value, mm -hmm. like the image we want to be. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's an incredible leadership technique to speak with someone and speak into their aspirational position and identity. Yeah. They're not there. Right. They're not there yet. Right. But I see it for them. And it's what you can be. And I'm going to mm -hmm. treat you as though you are. Right. That's what God does. I am does. coming out so, of my amen. skin. Yeah. Because so that's that, what so, God does. Someone no is speaking to you, inviting you up and in yeah. to a place it's that beautiful. you're not yet, but that you I, you are. It's in I've you heard to it become. described as the cork principle. So if you take a wine cork and you put it in a glass, an empty glass, it just lays on the bottom. But to the extent you pour into that glass, the cork will rise to that same level. Now you talk about football, they're evaluating you, they're not validating you, so they're not helping that cork rise. They're beating you up, so you gotta do it yourself. But what God does is he says, I just wanna pour into you and pour into you and pour into you and bring you to a level that you don't even understand you can be at. Your own vision for your life, your own vision of what validation looks like, of your dreams and your aspirations and your understanding of who you can be, that's so far below what I want to do with you and for you that you've got to trust me, God says, right? Let me tell you who you are and allow him pour into that glass. In the book that I write and shared with you guys, The QB Mentor, this star of that book is written about Coach Steve Wilson and his work with my son and me and dozens of quarterbacks around the country. And one of the concepts he shared is the concept of empowerment. And empowerment, he describes, is holding the vision and the dream for a person until they themselves can see it and grasp hold of it and own it. Wow. wow. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's and good. that's, that's empowerment, to empower someone to the place that they can go, that they probably don't think they can, they yep. don't know how, and they might not even have dreamed it. That's an incredible definition of empowerment. Mm -hmm. So in that lane, as we wrap up validation, if this is a core part of love and being loved is being validated, you know what the enemy's up to then? Oh, yeah. Discrediting. If validating is to bring value to something, yeah. then the enemy's going to try to strip, take, steal, kill, and destroy that value. Yeah, devalue. Devalue. And the beautiful idea that we're talking about here, what God is up to is validating us in a way to aspire to live at a certain level that he's created us to live. We're going to finish with your reactions to this mm -hmm. definition of validation. This is Webster. This isn't the Greek or the Hebrew, but this is just, listen to this definition, validation, to make valid, to substantiate, mm. confirm, to give official sanction, confirmation, or approval to someone 
for what they have achieved, accomplished, endured, or recovered. Wow. Yeah. I love okay. It. Wow. Why? What, what go struck ahead. you? You go ahead, Tom. You go first. To be recognized for what you've endured and what you've struggled through and put up with and battled is, is powerfully affirming, mm -hmm. you know, because a lot of people feel like the work they're doing, the efforts they're making, the sacrifices they're making is not even seen or known right. by anyone. Yeah. And to have that be given to you, it's what opens people's hearts. It's what brings tears. And the lack of it closes. Man, it's so discouraging when you mm -hmm. don't. Yeah. I know that's a big term. Yeah. You talk about open heart, closed heart toward people. These are the operational components of this. It's really powerful. I wrote my son's high school senior parents' night letter that was read in front of the seniors. And I read it without crying, I think. I like to think I did, but it was short and sweet, which is unusual for me. But the key line was, I said, son, I am so proud of you and what you've accomplished and more importantly, what you've overcome. Because the measure of a man is not just what he accomplishes or accumulates. Mm -hmm. The measure of many men is what they were able to endure and overcome and come out the other side. And we forget that flip side of the measure of a man and the validation of who he is and what he's done and what he's made for. Mm -hmm. The yeah. journey his heart's on, we're in a war. It's fraught with battles. In those battles, guys get hit. Remember the Rocky line when he's talking to his son? You talk about a little sermonette. Mm, oh it's yeah, not what about, was that, Rocky Five? It's not about how hard you can hit. It's about how hard you can get hit. And still, and still get up and keep going. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, and we watch it and, you know, I'm like, yeah. Yeah. Tell me that speech. I want to know that because it's, to your point, it's hard fought. And when it's recognized or seen, when it's validated, it's a very, very powerful thing. And to associate that validation with the one who loves you and gave somebody right. that package right. to give you, God doesn't want to be anonymous in that transaction. Yeah, I think the word that stuck out to me, Michael, most in that definition was confirmation. Because I think the most validating moments in my life that I can recall sitting here in this moment, and when I had the orientation to know whose I am and who loves me, Jesus, when I've experienced those moments of validation, I experienced them not entirely, but at least in part as a confirmation and a recognition that this really is who I am, because I know who Jesus is, and I know how he sees me as a beloved son. Mm -hmm. And that might sound to some like arrogance, you know, like, yeah, I am. I do need to be heard from more often, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, but that's not what it is. That's not what I'm, that is so vastly, <laughs> that's the false self version, I think, of what I'm describing. Right, right. The confirmation that I feel in my heart, I feel that recognition of that's really me yeah. that Jesus is talking about. That is me. As we wrap up, SJ, men, I remember one of my daughters, I gave her a compliment. This was those teenage years. I gave her a compliment about how she looked. She looked beautiful. And she said, dad, you're supposed to say that. Mm -hmm. Didn't really land in a soft place. I want the listeners to know the father doesn't have to love you. The father wants to love you. And I wanted my daughter to know that I'm her father. And I think when we recognize that it's hard to see sometimes because there's so much junk and stuff in the way that's come at us, our stories at some point or another have been littered with devaluing. So as the father is with the son through the spirit, wanting to love you and deliver the packages to pull you from the spell of those things, that you would begin to trust him just a little bit more than you did maybe yesterday, mm -hmm. that you would hold on or endure a little bit longer than, right. than you've had to, that love is coming and love is for you fiercely. And when it gets there, when he gets there, it's as tender as I can't hardly describe some of the stories that have made us cry in our own lives when needing provision, needing finances, needing resources for my family and this moment that I was praying, crying out to God, you know, we're in trouble. Are you going to come through? I need some resources. I need a check. And the next thing I heard was, Michael, I am the check. It yeah. was a thought as tangible as I'm talking right now. I knew who it was. Mm -hmm. And it brought a perspective 
I see you. I hear you. I want you. I'm with you. I love you. Hang on. It's coming. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to be connected to the gift. Yeah. It's coming and it's coming with me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, listeners, thank you for joining us for this first of, I think it's going to be a five part series on the ingredients of love. Thank you, Tom and Scott, for joining Michael and I today. And listeners, if you want to contact us with really anything at all, questions or show ideas, or you want to know more about what we've talked about today, just email us at exploringmore at zoe.org, Z-O-W-E-H dot O-R-G. If you can, it would help us immensely on your podcast platforms. Give us a rate and a review. Uh, It helps us get the word out there. We're so appreciative of that and so appreciative of your listenership. We'll see you next week. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of Exploring More. The landing page for this podcast is zoe.org forward slash podcast. That's Z-O-W-E-H dot org forward slash podcast, where you can find the show notes and various platforms to which we broadcast. You can also find us and the life of more by visiting Zoe on Uversion Bible app, Right Now Media, our Facebook page, and Zoe on Instagram and Twitter. Remember, with God there is always more, and you were made for more. Mm-hmm.